The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. I'm Liz Purnell, an Education and Training Specialist with the Institute of Child Nutrition. Welcome to the Team Up Thursday's webinar on financial management. The Institute of Child Nutrition, along with its Applied Research Division, has collaborated with USDA to develop Team Up for School Nutrition Success. Team Up is a unique learning experience designed to enhance the operation of school nutrition programs. It provides tailored technical assistance to programs that want to maintain a healthy environment and increase student meal program participation. As a follow-up to the Team Up Pilot Workshop back in 2014, a monthly webinar series was launched. It serves as a platform to further enhance partnerships and to provide an opportunity for all school nutrition professionals to discuss issues and provide solutions and best practices used by districts in key areas. The ICN has created a website for all materials and resources specifically related to Team Up. You can find the information at www.theicn.org slash teamup. Today's webinar will feature a panel of experts who will share strategies and best practices for the financial management of school nutrition programs. We will hear from two talented school nutrition professionals who will share their tips and tricks for keeping school nutrition budgets in good financial health. USDA's Food Nutrition Team Nutrition staff will also present their summer resources available for team nutrition schools to order for their summer food service programs. Now I'm pleased to take a few minutes to briefly introduce our panelists. David Roberts will start us off today. He is the Food Service Director for Maine School Administrative District number 52 in Turner, Maine. Next we will have Lynn Petrowski. She is the Director of Food Services for Hanover Public Schools in Hanover, Massachusetts. Then after Lynn, Kaylin Padovani, who is a nutritionist with USDA Food and Nutrition Services will provide information about team nutrition resources available for summer feeding programs. And lastly, I will wrap us up with a few announcements. During today's webinar, all attendees are muted. There will be a time for questions following each, each speaker's presentation. If you have a question, please type it in the question box on your screen. Now, David, I'll turn it over to you. Well, hello everybody. Thank you for tuning in today. We look forward to a nice discussion on financial management. As was mentioned, I'm the Food Service Director at SAD 52. That's in Central Maine, serving the towns of Green Leeds and Turner. Uh, we are in Androscoggin County, about an hour from the ocean and about an hour from the New Hampshire border. A little bit about our district and the demographics as of uh, the end of 2016. We had a student population just under 2,000. Free reduced rate of just under 40%. Uh, we're staffing with 24 employees, uh, 10 full-time, 10 part-time, a few subs. Our budget's under a million dollars, about a little over 900,000 as you can see there. Uh, six schools in our model, one high school, one middle school, and then four elementaries uh, throughout the towns. Participation rates for breakfast, we're doing about 40%. We use a grab-and-go model for our breakfast pre-K through six, and the high school, middle school is about one out of four students, as you can see there. Uh, lunch, we're over 60% pre-K through six, and a little bit under 60% for the secondary students. And you can see our overall rates here. About a third of our students are eating breakfast, and about two-thirds are eating lunch when you calculate in the meal equivalents for the a la carte sales. Some things that I feel that we do pretty well in our district that we've worked really hard at uh, would include uh, healthy U.S. school challenge recognition. We were the first in the state of Maine to be recognized by USDA. Uh, our four elementary schools got silver recognition, and a couple years later, our middle school became a gold level school, and that, that helped us to maintain high standards for nutrition and customer service as well. Uh, we're big believers on using USDA commodities. Uh, we have participated in net off invoice in some years, but recently we've uh, pretty much gone straight to brown box commodities and more scratch cooking to keep our food costs down. So we're big on using our commodities to save those dollars. 
we've set up salad bars in all of our schools. All six of them, our high school, middle school, have sandwich bars. Our high school has a taco, fajita burrito bar. And again, most of those proteins are U.S. commodity proteins that we use. We're able to serve quite a variety of products that way. We have what we call a value meal for grades 7 through 12. Many of you are using this where any entree can fit into the meal plan and the students are selecting their side dishes from vegetable and fruit components. Uh, gives them a good variety. At the high school we have as many as 20 entrees a day. By the time you count in uh, entree salads, uh, fajitas, burgers, chicken sandwiches, things like that. So they have a, a nice variety and uh, students from all pay levels can take any variety available. We don't have anything. We, don't, we do not restrict our free reduced students to certain choices in our cafeterias. Like I mentioned before, we have a grab-and-go uh, delivery service for our breakfast. Uh, in most cases, we're serving breakfast at two POS points in our schools. We find that logistically that works a lot better to get as many students through as quickly as possible so they don't lose time and the teachers and administration and administration remain more supportive that way when they feel like they're not we're not cutting into their time we run promotions uh, seasonally monthly uh, one thing that we do that's a bit unique is given that we're not a high free reduced district nor are we a low free reduced district right in the middle we have to be creative to maintain participation so we run a free breakfast week at the beginning of the year, usually the first week of November. We just provide free breakfast for all students, pre-K through 12, to get as many students exposed to our services as possible. And that usually helps with our participation going forward. Uh, again, many of students had had an access to the program. It's a good way to introduce them to our programs. Uh, we also, with our pre-K students, which is a new program in about the last five years, we're providing free breakfast and free lunch to our pre-K students for the entire year. Uh, it costs a little bit money up front, but it builds good participation rates in the early years and gets the students and families into a good practice of accessing our services. And we've seen some nice follow-up uh, participation levels as a result of that initiative. We meet with our managers every month and we focus on financials. Of course, we talk about recipes and menu plans and uh, local purchasing and all those nice things, but without a good financial foundation, uh, those things are really hard to accomplish. So we share financials as a team, and uh, each school looks at the individual financials so they can see where they stand with regard to their costs and their accounts. We belong to a purchasing cooperative, as many of you probably do. Uh, here in Maine, our we have one co-op that I belong to. We have about 22 school districts involved. It represents about almost 30,000 students. It doesn't sound like a lot maybe for some of you from bigger states, but it does increase our purchasing power, enables us to get uh, good pricing. And uh, I've been active in that. I'm a firm believer in that. It helps us as a medium-sized district to maintain a good pricing. We work together as a management team to come up with a menu. We solicit information from all the vested parties to include students and parents. Uh, the order guide, I provide that for my managers. And I restrict the order guide to items that are on the menu. So we're not just buying items willy-nilly, so to speak, but it's targeted purchasing with a view to supporting the defined menu. Some of the challenges we face, again, you'll see these are probably common to your district as well. Uh, here in Central Maine, we're seeing declining enrollments. Uh, we've been called the oldest state in the nation. A lot of our young folks are leaving for uh, bigger and better paying jobs. So uh, we don't have big families anymore, so to speak, uh, as a general rule. We've been losing about 1% of our participation, excuse me, 1% of our enrollment each year. So in the 14 years that I've been here, we've lost about 300 students out of 2,000 or so. So we were at 22 something and now we're at 1,900 or so. So that's a big challenge and that's something that's not within our control. We're also seeing our participation shrink a little bit, the percentage of our participation. Uh, again, that's got to do with, you know, implementing new meal plans and, and some the challenges of receptivity 
for our products. So it's kind of a double-edged sword there that we're dealing with, and it's, it can be very challenging. We're seeing increasing labor and benefit costs. As you know, most of us are not negotiating for those packages. Our, our employees uh, receive labor and benefit packages that are negotiated by somebody else, so we have to inherit those costs and manage them the best that we can. We're trying to maintain our staffing levels, even though we're losing a little bit of, of uh, enrollment. I hate to cut back on staffing levels and service models unless we have to, because I don't want to roll back the progress we've made, uh, yet these things do come at a cost. Changing food preferences, we know that our students are becoming more uh, savvy with regard to their palates. There's a lot of competition out there with restaurants and food courts. So we need to keep up with the trends if we're going to maintain our market share. We're always trying to control, minimize food waste. Uh, I'm sure you've seen that as we try to make our menus more complex and offer more choices, it becomes more difficult to manage uh, our waste and our projections can be challenging, but it can be done with good controls. Always trying to maintain good food quality and variety. Again, that's a challenge. It involves training the staff and, and purchasing the right products. Implementing procurement policies effectively, uh, we know that that's been a big change and a big point of emphasis for USDA, so all of our purchasing now needs to be done competitively, uh, not just our prime vendors, but also our ancillary sources as well. That's a challenge. Implementation of USDA guidelines, you probably know about that. We're looking at uh, trying to get some flexibility in those going forward, but uh, the moving target, so to speak, can be challenging for all of us. Expectations of minimal local subsidy support. Um, I'm assuming your funding model is similar to ours. We get a good chunk of our revenue from parents and students in the paid category. We get another good chunk from state and federal reimbursements through USDA. And then if that's not enough to cover our expenses, we're asking for a local subsidy from our local taxpayers, usually from their property taxes. So. Our expectation in this district is to keep that component as small as possible, uh, which I think makes sense, and, and that's kind of been our guiding philosophy financially. Staff recruitment, training, and retention, uh, you know about those challenges. Uh, we want to make it a good place to work and, and keep the good people as best we can. So what are some of the strategies we've implemented here at SAD 52? Well, Communication is a big thing, especially with our management team. Letting them know what the goals and expectations are and communicating that consistently with them on a regular basis to reinforce those expectations. We share measurables monthly. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail, but I believe it's important for every manager to know what their food cost is and what their labor cost is, what their cost for other paper, plastic, chemicals, what are their participation rates, what are their meal counts looking like, uh, we share all those uh, those numbers on a monthly basis. Uh, maintaining excellent food quality. Uh, if you're struggling with participation, that's one place to look right there. Is, is your product something that is saleable? Invest in equipment intelligently. I have learned over the years that if, if you don't spend money on equipment and you look like you're having a down year, you're probably not saving money. You probably didn't replace something you should have replaced. So we try to spread out our equipment investment uh, with a view to uh, maintaining good equipment and reinvesting in the things that are going to break down before they break down. Review and adjust staffing levels. Now this is a good one because it's very easy to add staff when sales are increasing and meal counts are increasing. And that should be done. It should be reviewed on a regular basis, at least annually. The hard part is when you're losing total revenue in against a backdrop of declining enrollments and you have too much staff. How do you do that? Well, you can do it through attrition in a lot of cases, but we review every location, every school annually, and before the new year starts, we've had to make some adjustments. We've had to maybe a, maybe a five-hour position becomes a four-hour position. Uh, maybe a three-and-a-half becomes a, a 3.0. Uh, they're tough calls to make, but if your sales volume isn't there to support the staffing that you have, you have to react accordingly. Uh, I would rather make the decision myself as the director 
than be told by my business manager or my superintendent that I have to do something. I try to be proactive. Charge policies. Now that's going to be a requirement very soon here. There should be some kind of charge policy in place, and I know that's a touchy subject. Uh, nobody wants to deny a student food. Uh, we don't do that K through six. Uh, we do have uh, a gentle nudge that we do, and uh, with the older kids, uh, we have we have limits as well. So I'm not going to tell you how to write your charge policy, but you got to have something in place that's consistently enforced and well understood by your uh, parents and students. We collaborate with other directors and adopt successes. That's one good thing about school food service that I've noticed coming from a restaurant background. You never had this luxury. But you can call your neighbor, or go to the SNA meetings in your state, you know, work with your co-op directors, whatever organizations you have, uh, pick each other's brains, find out what's working, uh, visit other schools if you can, collaborate, and find out what those best practices are and then implement them. Promote nutrition services to every listening ear. It's your job to do that at the, at the faculty meetings, at the board meetings, uh, any place you can, uh, in the supermarket, at the ball games. Talk good about your program. Use multiple media. We've, we've used newspapers. We, we use our websites. We're tinkering with Facebook a little bit now. Uh, do what you can to get your message out there. It's better to be in front of it and have a positive message in fact, I was on the news last night. I just found out about that. We were in a uh, farm-to-school cook-off, and one of the local television stations was there. I haven't even seen the video yet, but things like that. Involve yourself in those type of activities and try to have positive media representation of what you're doing in your programs. I like the charts and graphs quite a bit. You'll see here I, I look at trends a lot. This is a 10-year study of our enrollment in blue. You see that it's gradually going down. It's artificially inflated in the later years because our pre-K students are in there, but we only have them twice a week. So they really don't count as full students. Uh, you can see that our enrollment, our meal counts had gone up for a while. We leveled off a little bit. Our breakfast has grown. It's leveled off a bit. So I think it's important to know what your trends are and uh, know where they're going and see what you can do to, to make them stay in the positive direction. I put this together just to show what our revenue sources are. For example, the lower column of the bar in the red, those are cash payments that we get from students and families. And the orange is reimbursements. You can see that our reimbursements have increased over the 10-year span because we've increased our marketing of reimbursable meals. And consequently, our local subsidy, the blue cap on each column, uh, is relatively small compared to our total revenue sources. So we try to keep that subsidy in our district. We're asking for about five to seven percent of our total revenue a year from the local taxpayers. I'd love it if it was zero, but we're just not quite big enough to run a break-even model at this point. Other measurables that we like to talk about is uh, how many, what are you spending, what kind of dollars are you spending by category location? We do that monthly. I also represent that as a revenue ratio. In other words, uh, how much of your revenue is needed to spend on food, or how much, what percentage of your revenue is needed to spend on staffing. Revenue dollars by category and location, you ought to know what your revenue for each school is. Where is it coming from? Is it paid meals? Is it a la carte? Keep track of your meal counts, that's important as well. Uh, what are your free reduce rates? What are your participation rates? You should know all these things, and your managers should know them as well. Uh, and I run reports on overdue account balances on a monthly basis and share them with our managers and ask them how they're doing with their collections uh, and provide support as needed. Now this graphic is a little tedious to look at, no doubt, but I wanted to just touch on it briefly. I'm collecting data over a five-year span. I like to look at five-year blocks. Uh, and when I do my monthly reports, I look at, like for example, at the end of April, I'll look at the last five Aprils by location and by category. So when I generate a chart, it looks something like this. Uh, for the district, there's our salary expense to the left over the last five years. This is a whole year snapshot here. So I get a five-year view of what our salary costs are. And I get a five-year view of our food costs. 
You see the food costs are trending down, which is good because our enrollment's a little bit down. Uh, equipment and other, pretty stable. And then this particular graphic here represents those costs as a percentage of our total revenue. So it can be deceiving if, if your expenses are going down, that's great. But if your revenues are dropping twice as fast as your expenses, then your percentages are going to go up. And you don't want those to go up. You want to keep your food cost uh, close to 40, your uh, staff cost. If you can keep it at 40, you're doing good. We're always closer to 50. I track revenues by category. Lunches, those are reimbursable meals. There's our adult meals. Other, those are a la carte sales, breakfast sales, and state. That's just my catchphrase for all the total reimbursements. That includes state and federal reimbursements. So we can see where the revenue is coming from by category on a given time period and what it's, how it's trending over a five-year period. Tracking meal counts, you can see that the uh, paid lunches are trending downward, reduced or holding steady. Free, you hold it fairly steady. Breakfast is maybe trending down just a little bit, but again, this is taken into consideration that we are losing students, so we're trying to maintain the accounts that we have, and it's important, I think, to look at the trends graphically and visually. This is just one of our schools, Tripp Middle School. It just shows the free reduced rate over the span of 10 years. I also show participation rates by school, so the group of columns to the left are all six of our schools and their breakfast participation rates so they can compare how they're doing with their neighbors. What you're going to find is, is implementing change is difficult. So I put together this graphic. I won't read through the whole thing, but when I first started implementing change, I used to hear the same excuses over and over again. So I made a, a graphic. And the one I heard most often was, we don't have enough time to do that. I'm sure you've heard that. My follow-up question is, is it the right thing to do? Can we be more efficient? Can we be more productive? Well, we tried that before and it didn't work. Have you heard that one? Well, did Mount Everest get climbed on the first try? Probably not. I think we can overcome our challenges. We've always done it that way. Well, why are we doing it that way? Can we rethink it and do it better? This might look familiar. We don't have enough time to do that. It keeps coming up, doesn't it? We never did it that way before. Well, people never did laundry in a machine until one was invented. Maybe we're, maybe we're behind the times a little bit. It's too hard to do it that way. Well, you might have to learn some new techniques. It's a lot faster to get there on a bicycle than it is to walk, but you've got to take the time to ride a bicycle. This might look familiar to you. We don't have enough time to do that. That's not part of our job description. Well, if it contributes to the overall mission, it certainly applies. Nobody likes it that way. This is one of my favorite ones. Who's nobody? Are we talking about you personally, the staff, or is that really what our customers told you? So you need to get to the bottom of it to make change happen. And finally, I won't even bother reading it this time, but those are challenges that you're going to face with your staff, and they, they can be overcome. So as a takeaway moment, I'd just give you some key words. Communicate, empower, measure, review results, coach, and commend. And then if you keep your staff happy, they'll be more productive. Keep them involved, support them, provide them what they need, and communicate effectively. Questions at this time? All right, here's a question here. It says, is the district from Maine running in the black? Well, if you count our local subsidy of about 7%, yes, we are running in the black. Another question says, how do you pay for the free breakfast week and the free pre-K meals? Well, that's lost revenue for us. We, we absorb that cost. It doesn't come from anybody. So what happens is we, we accept the reduced amount of revenue now and view it as seed money for future participation rates. Next question is, why do you staff hours, what's your staff hours make up for your breakfast at an elementary school? 
most of our elementary schools only have two staff members. I have a full-time manager and a part-time staff member. Typically, I have the part-time of working about five hours. That's just enough to stretch them from the beginning of breakfast serve to the end of lunch. So it's, it's a pretty tight staffing model, but it allows coverage during both service periods. How do you respond to, we don't have time? Well, I asked the question, you know, is it, is it the right thing to do for the students? Is it something that we can do to provide better customer service? And are we working as efficiently as possible? And what can we do to be more productive? So those questions need to be asked before that question can be answered. Uh, here's another question. What training did you provide to your staff so they understood food costs, labor hours, et cetera? I've shown them examples. Uh, I show them the formulas, obviously, tell them how it's calculated. Uh, and we use the what if scenario. What if, what if you increased your revenue by a certain amount? What would that do to your food cost? And, and if your food cost is too high, what can you do to make it lower? So you've got to demonstrate to them where these numbers are coming from. Well, I hope that helped. I don't see any more questions. Uh, here's the one, looks like a final question. Will the recording of this webinar be available after? I think the PowerPoint presentation will be available. I'm not sure about the recording. That's a question for somebody else. Looks like we're out of questions, but thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I hope the information I provided was helpful. I'm going to turn it over now to Lynn. She's going to be next on our panel. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, David. Uh, a tough act to follow, and I hope everybody will appreciate our New England accents, David being from Maine, and I'm from Massachusetts. Thanks for having me today. A little bit about Hanover Public Schools, where I'm the director. I've been here for six years. And these are our demographics from a couple of years ago, 2014, 2015 school year. We have a relatively small district, 25, just over 2,500 students, with a 10% free and a 1% reduced rate. So it's pretty difficult here in Hanover for us to be financially solvent. We have 24 employees. Our budget this year is $950,000, and I'm always striving for that $1 million mark. We have five schools in total, one high school, one middle school, and three elementary schools. We only serve breakfast at the secondary level only, so in a very low participation because we are a fairly affluent town. My, um, my What I always say is that to take it or leave it or school breakfast well, we're here anyways you know though we're not a big breakfast option for students we do offer it and I do offer it in the event that somebody needs it I would not want to not have a breakfast program when I do have some students that are in need our lunch participation is at 50 percent uh, it's gone up a little bit this year and what's funny about Hanover is that our secondary schools carry our elementary schools. Usually in, um, in a school district, the elementary schools will have higher participation rates than the secondary, middle, and high. And here in Hanover, we, our secondary participation is over 50%, nearing 60 for the middle and also for the high school. And that's, I attribute that just to the type of food and the variety of food that we serve. So when I include my non-program food and a la carte purchases in my um, labor studies, my meal equivalents, we're at about 69% in of including everything. So what do we do? Uh, our best practices, we have three of them that I'll talk about today. And the first one is that we prepare a budget. And that budget helps me to plan for a specific period of time. And it's normally a fiscal year that runs from July 1 to June 30th. I'm sure that's similar for everybody out there. And what I do when I'm preparing a budget is I consider uh, what do I plan to do next year? 
uh, say an objective for me would be I want to increase my participation by 5% overall by adding a salad bar. So once I determine that goal of 5% increase in the objective by utilizing a salad bar, I'm going to forecast any costs that, that that's going to incur. How much is it going to cost me to staff that? How much is the food cost going to be? What's the equipment cost? So I want to project the revenue to cover those costs of that additional activity. So there's two types of a budget that you can do. A zero based is when you start with zeros every year. And, and that's not one I use. I use an incremental budget and I base all of my projections on my previous year. Um, most districts do use an incremental, but some do a combination. So if I'm going to do my, in, my incremental budget, I'm first going to consider revenue. What was my revenue this past year? How do I see, do I see an increase, as um, David had said, do you see an increase in your reimbursements from your local, state, federal monies? Uh, miscellaneous, am I going to be doing in any more catering? Do I plan to capture more of my adult audience with that salad bar or other programs that I put in place? or any kind of a fund transfer in. Um, you know, is part of my secretary salary will come out of the administrative budget. So there'll be a transfer in to cover her when she works for somebody else. So uh, then we look at expenditures. And expenditures can vary from district to district. And you know, you hear as when we go out to our SNA meetings that everybody has different levels of expenditures that can make or break your program. Labor and benefits are one. Uh, smaller districts tend not to have to pay health care benefits, uh, but larger districts tend to, to have to pay those benefits. But we do pay our vacation benefits, our personal time benefits for employees. Professional services may include those of uh, website development or, or maintenance, property services, we consider our food purchases and USDA food purchases, including transportation. We look at our supplies and other paper goods, chemicals, indirect costs, uh, if you're being charged for any custodial services in your district, any electricity, gas, trash removal, anything miscellaneous, and then any kind of fund transfer out of your budget. So I'll also look at food and labor cost percentages. And, and David did a great job so that I can kind of bounce off of what he was saying. Uh, I try to keep my food cost percentages between 40 and 45%. Uh, I'm a little bit high here because uh, the food quality, I, I have to have a better food quality in order to get the business in, particularly in a, a district where we do not have a high percentage of free and reduced uh, population. Uh, the choices these, these children do not need to eat at school, so I have to make my menu and selections that much more appealing. 40 to 45 percent on labor. If, if labor exceeds 50 percent of my um, total budget or total income, then there's something wrong and I need to adjust it. I've always gone with 50 percent being the maximum amount of labor that you would want, which leaves 10 to 20 percent for other. And other may be your equipment, your supplies, your maintenance, and that's not a heck of a lot. When you look at all those adding up to 100 percent, we want to add to our bottom line to increase um, our program's fund balance. There's not a lot of wiggle room there. So you really need to zero in on those numbers. And, and make sure that you stay within those categories. And when I talk about, I always think about participation trends, student demographics. And in those, you know, again, as David said, his population is decreasing. Mine is increasing. So we have, you know, some, some growth in the town. We have redistricting occurring. So I'll think about that when I develop my budget. I, I may have a first grade class that are good eaters. So I'll anticipate that as they move forward. Or I'll have a fourth grade group moving into the middle school that tends to be very big in purchasing. 
So I look at those kinds of trends as I move forward uh, and see how that's going to affect my budget and uh, adjust my numbers accordingly. And then equipment needs. Um, I know that if my buildings are aging and I have specific equipment needs, I may request capital money from the town. I've requested anything over $10,000. I request for the town's assistance because we have a small district, I want to be able to maintain the uh, integrity of my, my program. I can't spend $30,000 on a serving line and expect to keep my numbers for food, labor, and other in, that same ca in those categories. So I look ahead for equipment needs. I have a strategic plan. I'm part of the strategic plan for the district in um, replacing equipment and um, improving, making kitchen improvements and remodeling. The second best practice that we, we consider uh, is to control our costs. And controlling costs, we have some fixed prices and we have some variables. So there's some things that are easier to control than others. Uh, the menu development and meal cost. I, I develop menus, on cycle menus, on a yearly basis. And I look at new items that are coming in and, and see what those are going to cost and try to use my USDA foods to offset the cost of some of our meals over a, a weekly basis. I always look at a weekly basis for our food costs. But when we look at that, we want to make sure that our revenue is equal or greater than the cost to prepare it. Uh, it doesn't make any sense if you're going to uh, waste money putting something on the menu. I'm not going to put anything on my menu that's a waste of time or it's a waste of money. I'm not going to waste people's time putting things on there that students won't buy or don't like. So again, I look at my forecasting. Um, how do my menu items perform? I want to prevent waste uh, when I overproduce foods and reduce customer satisfaction due to underproduction of food because you can have disgruntled customers when you run out of food on a regular basis. So I use my production sheets quite a bit um, when it comes to controlling costs. I always look at my numbers. I look, we look at our numbers daily. And one uh, trick that I tell my, my managers to use is we have a monthly menu where we will, I'll tell them just put in the number that you sold that day. So my monthly published menu, say I have um, chicken broccoli Alfredo today, and I sold 400 meals. I'll have them pencil in that 400 meals. If then, uh, if I had 200 meals and there was a everybody was sick, there was a flu, there was a field trip, I'll tell them to write that down, and then they can maintain less paperwork that way. They don't have to shuffle through their production records. And they can just look back and say, oh, this was a good performer. This wasn't. Why wasn't it? Maybe everybody was out sick. So it's a really good, quick point of reference for the, uh, the managers in the kitchen. I, too, participate in a cooperative purchasing group here in Massachusetts. Uh, we are required to obtain the best price and quality for our district, and I think that that's easily done through collaborative purchasing. There's 93 towns in our current collaborative, and uh, you know we all take turns that way, and the bulk of the work is not on one person's shoulder to develop bids and specifications and um, maintain that they do the legal paperwork for us that we need. When it comes to food production and controlling costs, again, I'm, I'm relying on my production sheet. Uh, it monitors my waste. Uh, I, I sometimes will stand by the trash barrel and see what children are throwing away. We do not have any sharing tables here at this time. And we do incorporate the offer versus serve at all of our levels and encourage children just to, to take what they're going to eat and do allow them if they are going to eat more to take more. So if somebody wants to take two pieces of fruit, I'll say to them, oh, are you going to eat that? You know, don't take it if you're going to put it in the trash. But 
if you kind of hang around by the trash barrels, they see you there, and, and nobody wants to disappoint you, especially those, those younger elementary kids. So it sometimes will help them to, to eat what's on their tray. Um, inventory management is a very big piece of controlling costs. Uh, what I think is that you should have your inventory specific to your district, and you should definitely train two people in inventory. I know it's another whole module and set of rules, but um, have the same form for everybody. Try to have limit the number of items that you have on your inventory. Make sure that staff's trained on how to take it. Some people will record cases, some will record cans, some will record pounds, and if they pass it in, and it's not saying anything that specific, you don't know what they mean, so it's that much more work for you. So I make sure that everybody's on the same page, everybody's trained, there's two people doing it for accountability, and that helps me to determine what my actual food costs are. Um, and I do utilize uh, a lot of USDA foods. We've um, implemented here in Massachusetts, we have our brown box that we predict for the upcoming year. We have our diversion, and then we have the DOD FRESH program. So I'm not quite sure how people are across the United States with um, how they do their USDA foods, but ours here is very successful. And in my own district, I've been able to go from utilizing about 40% when I came up to using right now, I'm at 80%. So I anticipate using all of my funds this year, and that helps us control our costs really well. The last piece is the financial accountability, and this is the piece that, that none of us like, but uh, we're, we should have a three-month capital uh, operating budget on hand in the event that anything happens, that um, we just want to be able to operate without any income or be able to maintain that level. But uh, we use meal pricing and paid lunch equity on a yearly basis. I use that for school committee to ask for increases in, in meal costs. I am one of the lower price districts in my area, so I always grab the surrounding districts costs of meal costs and present to school committee saying, well, see, we're still doing, doing a great job here. We're maintaining our costs and, and expenditures, and we're doing it for a little bit less than, than our surrounding districts. And um, I also look, I do the meals per, per labor hour on a monthly basis to gauge the effectiveness of our operation and the level of productivity. And um, as Dave had said, it's, it's very easy to give out hours when things are going well. So you have to give those out very sparingly, but you're a big hero when you're able to say, well, geez, I have another two hour spot. I can... Uh, open up for people to come in and expand the operation. And I, I once heard somebody say, if you're not growing, you're dying. So we're always looking for a way to grow the program, to change the program, to keep people interested, uh, have our, our employees buy in to what we're trying to do and we're trying to feed kids nutritious, delicious, and attractive meals at a cost-effective rate. I also provide, uh, we do a monthly profit and loss statement, and on that profit and loss statement, there's a summary of our revenues, our costs and expenses, and it can be done for any length of time. We do it monthly here, but we are required to turn it into the state here in Massachusetts on a quarterly basis so that the state knows how our operating budget's going as well. Uh, a balance sheet is something that we complete yearly and it, that's also, it's a summary of, it's a, a snapshot in time. It's done here uh, in June, and it tells what our assets, equity, and liabilities are. So any pre-program, um, any money that people have prepaid into the program is an asset of ours. Uh, student debt would be a liability, as uh, well now we're able to carry that student debt forward rather than having it paid off through the general fund. So at the end of the year, the State Department knows exactly where I stand here in Hanover School. 
But what, what I say is, and I, I've said in my in our team up is, evaluate your revenues and expenditures regularly because if you let it get away from you, you can end up up the creek. We, uh, you know, you don't want to find out in May that you're losing money when you don't have any time to make a change. You know, you want to be able to evaluate your finances on a regular basis and and make any kind of adjustments you may need. You may need to adjust your food cost. You may need to adjust your staffing. You may need to adjust your meal prices. So you don't want any surprises, and neither do your um, it does the administration. You know, I'm not. I don't want to show up there in June, uh, costing my town money to bail me out. So we stay on top of. Uh, of all of our expenses, and it's sometimes it's easy as what did we make and what did we spend, just like at home. So um, that's what I would say is very important: is not to let it go and to try to develop a budget, develop some cost control measures, and maintain your appropriate reporting, particularly the profit and loss and the inventory, because the inventory is money on your shelf. So that's. The last one for me, what do we have for questions here? I don't see any questions. I believe I will turn over to Kaylin. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Lynn, for passing me over. Um, Speaking about financial management tips shared by David at Lean, school can secure their investment by helping students stay healthier year-long even during the summer break. I'm very excited to share with you the latest team nutrition materials to support summer meals. Last May 2016, the Food and Nutrition Service released a collection of nutrition education resources to support summer site providers in English and Spanish languages. These exciting materials developed under the agency Team Nutrition Initiative are designed to help kids and families to make healthy food choices and be physically active during the summer months. These materials include an infographic, parents' guide, and a step-by-step -step kit. The Summer Food Summer Move is a dynamic and flexible resource kit for summer meal site operators, which include one operator guide with 30 nutrition education activities and kids-friendly recipes, seven educational posters, six types of promotional flyers, an activity placement, and a set of six different educational handouts for families. The kit is designed to be used in a variety of summer meal site types, ranking from parks to school to community or church-based settings. The operator guide is a 60 pages publication designed to get summer meal site operators started with implementing nutrition, education, and physically and physical activity-based enrichment programs at their summer meal site. Our pilot testing of the of this kit at the summer meal sites across the country in 2015 revealed that kids, parents, and site operators enjoyed the activity and had a great appreciation 
of their summer meal sites after activities began to be implemented. School can start getting students excited about a healthy summer with these fun activity placement created to reinforce my play message and the four healthy moves. Kids can color, decode nutrition messages, and laugh at few funny food jokes with these summer food, summer moves placement. Before the classes end, school can share with family these six activity family guides. They feature seats for parents, games for family, and fun recipes and tasting activities to help the whole family making healthy and beverage choices and getting more physically active over the summer months. School can also send home supplemental resources that include an infographic and parents' handouts. The Take a Healthy Summer Break infographic is designed to raise awareness about the four healthy moves and is unique in that it is, it is not only present issues but also highlights actionable solutions that families can use to have a healthier summer break. It also provides information on how families can locate a summer meal site in their local area. The parents brochure entitled This Summer, It's Smart to Play Hard is a piece that also provides information on the four healthy moves, includes a recipe and a fun family challenge to encourage entire family, family to work together to adopt healthier behaviors and to celebrate their wins with a healthy reward. These resources were focused group tested with English and Spanish speaking parents, and they really love the actionable tips provided in the parents' guide. They appreciated the detailed tips that could be customized to their family. Team Nutrition also has a four pages tip sheet entitled, Offering Healthy Summer Meals That Kids Enjoy. This resource provides tips to help meal providers to improve participation, satisfaction, and the nutrition quality of the meal. It features simple tips, sample menus, a fun taste test ballot, and a planning worksheet for site operators and sponsors. There are additional ideas about how to engage volunteers and staff on how to incorporate local food in these colorful handouts. Meal operators can put their new inspiration into action with the interactive goal setting section. The handout information helps every type of site, from small, small, from small big, or vended, to make their summer meal program fun and healthy. Visit Team Nutrition website and use the resource order form to order print copies of this material. Print copies are free for those participating in the USDA child nutrition program. This includes regional offices, state agencies, schools, child care providers, and summer meal sponsors on site allow two to four weeks for the delivery of the requested orders. I appreciate your attention and time and encourage you to stay in touch with Team Nutrition. Visit Team Nutrition website to sign up for a monthly electronic newsletter, follow us through the Twitter, and feel free to send us any email to the address provided in this slide. If we have some time for questions, remember to send it through the chat box so I can read it out loud and answer as many questions as time allows us.
If we don't have any questions, I will turn it over to Liz that she will provide us some announcements. Thank you, Kaylin. I would also like to thank our other panelists for sharing their information today and thank our participants for listening in. Uh, this almost wraps up our presentation, but I have a few announcements before we conclude. Upcoming Team Up State events are planned in Vermont during May, and Iowa and South Dakota are having events in July. Be looking this summer for Team Up for School Nutrition Success, designed specifically for site managers. USDA and ICN will present Team Up pre-conference workshops at SNA's ANC in Atlanta in July. Workshops are designed for state agency personnel and school nutrition directors. And remember that all webinars are recorded and can be viewed on the Team Up for School Nutrition Success website. Snapshots of state events are also available on the website. I'd also like to take a quick opportunity to mention that in an effort to meet your online training needs, ICN will be launching a brand new e-learning portal to replace its current online training system. The new system will have a fresh new look it is simple to navigate and will continue to have a searchable catalog. Certificates will still be available. You can even upload certificates from other trainings you've attended to keep all of your documentation in one place. It's mobile friendly and will provide an enhanced online training experience anytime and anywhere. Here's some important information that will help you transition to the new system. Current user profiles and certificate transcripts will not be transferred to the new system, so it's important that you access your account and download the certificates you wish to keep as soon as possible. To keep you informed, we have created a web page of information concerning the launch. This link provides responses to frequently asked questions and includes instructions for downloading your, your certificates. We're here to help. If you have any questions or need assistance accessing your profile and certificates, please email the ICN Help Desk at helpdesk at theicn.org or call us at 1-800-321-3054. This concludes our Team Up Thursday's webinar. Thanks again for your participation and have a great day.